Hi, and welcome to Great Getaways. We're starting today's show here in the Great Sand Bay in the amazing Keweenaw Peninsula. We're going to be showing you vistas that are beyond description. We're going to bring history alive, and we're going back into the wilderness to the Montreal River. That, we've got a lot more. Let's get it started. Production of Great Getaways is made possible by Rocky's Great Outdoors. Located in Burton, Michigan, Rockies carries a complete line of motorcycle, snowmobile, camping, and hiking gear, including canoes and kayaks. State Building Company, serving mid-Michigan for over 50 years, with quality windows, insulation, roofing, and siding, including complete residential and commercial remodeling. Forward Corporation, operating over 30 complete convenience centers, motels, and restaurants across Northeast Michigan. We're really excited right now. We're here in the most northern part of Michigan in the Keweenaw Peninsula. When you make a trip up here, one of the first stops you want to make is here in Calumet at the Visitor Center. We're going in, we're going to find out all the things we can do and all the fun we're going to have. Come on along. Well, hi, you must be Diane. I am, and you must be Tom. I am. Nice supposed to meet, to meet you. you here. That's good. It's good to meet you, too. Welcome to the Keweenaw. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, we have come to the right place here at the Tourism Center, I know that, uh, but we also have uh, you here who, your family has been here for years. Since the 1860s. So you probably know a little bit about this place. Just then. a little bit, yes. Is it uh, people friendly? It's very people friendly. This is like living in old America. I mean, we give the friendliest people on earth that you'll find in this area. Okay, what do people do when they come all the way up here? You know, a little bit of everything. And no matter what you're interested in, we have it from national parks to scenic byways, beaches, uh, mountain biking, hiking, a little bit of everything. All right, we'd like to take a look around, see some of the things that you have to do. Can you set us up on some kind of a schedule or tell us where we can go to, to do some of these things? I think we're going to keep you busy for days. You're never going to want to leave. All right, that's the way I like it. Just out of curiosity, uh, just like you said, days, so, uh, plenty of motels and restaurants around for people? Plenty. We have motels, hotels, bed and breakfast, historic inns, any kind of lodging facility you'd need. All right. Sounds good. What do you say we get down to it then and pick some places to go? Sounds great. The Keweenaw Peninsula forms the northernmost contiguous landmass of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Sometimes called the Upper Peninsula's Upper Peninsula, the Keweenaw extends some 75 miles north into Lake Superior as measured from the southernmost point of Keweenaw Bay. Being nearly surrounded by the legendary might of Lake Superior, it should come as no surprise that the Keweenaw has seen its share of shipwrecks. In the early days of Great Lake shipping, the Keweenaw Peninsula forced sailors into the deeper realms of Lake Superior's grasp. The winds and waves in this stretch of water can be fierce, and the broken timbers of many a lost vessel testify to the fact along the peninsula's eastern shore. One of Michigan's five underwater preserves is located at the far northern tip of the Keweenaw at Copper Harbor. This preserve contains 18 diveable wrecks, including the Mesquite, a 180-foot modern Coast Guard cutter which was dashed against the perilous shoals not far from shore. Obviously, the Keweenaw Peninsula should also have a fine assortment of lighthouses, and it does. All are automated now, but many offer tours and small museum displays detailing the peninsula's maritime heritage. One of the nicest features of the Keweenaw Peninsula is that it's fairly small. You can do a lot in just one day. It's barely 60 miles from Houghton and Hancock at the far northern end of the road. From east to west, you'll travel no more than 25 miles at the widest point. As you will see, We'll be crisscrossing the peninsula from beginning to end and stop to stop on today's program. But as the dawn's summer warmth began burning away the early morning mists, the boys' sunrise journey down the coastline quickly became worth it. From alongside the shore of Lake Superior, the Keweenaw's mountains climbed in back of them, conjuring up visions of other, more famous coastlines of the United States. With a start like this, it just had to be a good day. Tom and Denny followed the lakeshore south along US 41 to Lake Linden. Here they took M26 north. The first stop of the day was just down the road. 
here in the Keweenaw, there's all kinds of things to see. One of the big items in the historical items here is the mining that went on. Right now, we've come up to the Delaware Mine, and I'm with Tom Pointer. He's the owner up here. And uh, Tom, you've got tours that go on at the mine, and, and you've got uh, old buildings around. Can you tell us a little bit about what this is? Okay, well, this mine started back in 1847, and they ran about 40 years till 1887. So they went through the whole gamut from hand drilling on up to the area where they had the compressed air drills even. So this building we're looking at right back here, this was built in the 1870s and housed big steam engines to run the hoists. They had boilers and hoist engines here. This was state of the art at that time. No kidding. <laughs> well, the buildings have really lasted a long time. Yeah. I'm just surprised that they're still standing. It is amazing. They did some beautiful work here. You know, they, you can see the corners on these. They cut them. They had good stonemasons back in that era. And this rock came right out of the mine. So they used what was on site. Oh. They used a little bit of uh, Jacobsville sandstone, which comes from this area too, for some of the engine basins. Okay, so well, everything came from right around here then. That's right. You no. couldn't bring it in too easily. Well, what about, what happened to the mine? Well, the mine operated till 1887, ran out of copper, and then they closed up. Then over the years, as uh, they needed scrap metal, say around World War I, they came through these areas and they took the old engines and things like this, scrapped it, so the only thing left are these stone walls, which could hold up. All the wood kind of disappeared over the years. Uh, you do actually have mine tours where people can go down into the mine? That's right. We have tours seven days a week during the summer from mid-May to mid-October. And we start out by showing a nice introductory video. It takes about four minutes. And the people see what it's like and where to go. And then they put hard hats on and down they go. They walk down steps for about 100 feet to the first level. And they walk almost 1,400 feet into the mine and finally come to the end, then turn around, come back out, back up the stairs, right where they began. Now, how many levels are in the mine? Well, there are 10 levels, but they're flooded up to the first level. Okay. So the first level's open, and you can see the water below. And back in the day, they had a big steam engine driving a pump, and that's how they kept it dry. Aha. Uh -huh. So, uh, again, what, when were the times <laughs> that you're open? We're open mid-May to mid-October, seven days a week. Okay, and there you go. Great place. You can stop here. You learn a little bit about history. Actually, go down into one of the old mines. Really cool. In the Keweenaw, many of the most pleasant memories come from an interaction with the lake. One of the lake's greatest interactions can be seen along the Keweenaw's western shore. Great Sand Bay is an incredible expanse of dunes sculpted over centuries by the combined power of the glaciers and the incessant lake winds. Thousands of years of turbulence have left nothing but the beauty, though, and our journeys have often included stops along this scenic place. It was a fine time for reflection. Of all the times we've been here, no one could remember a calmer scene. The lake was flat, save just the easiest lapping of water along the sand. It was a good time to just stand along the shore and enjoy another of the wondrous moments to be found in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. One of the stops you want to make when you come into the Keweenaw is up here on M26. Now we're just north of Eagle River and we stopped at a place called the Great Sand Bay. Very high sand banks that overlook Lake Superior. You have to be a little bit careful because sometimes the sand will actually be blown across the road so you want to be a little bit careful but you pull in here there's a nice sign here that tells you a little bit about Lake Superior and as you can tell the scenery is terrific here. And this is just a sampling of the great views you're going to see. Receding glaciers left the long, sloping coastline here along the Keweenaw's far northwestern shore. The buffeting winds and seas of Lake Superior then helped create this current expanse of dunes, ripping away the softest grasses and topsoil. Over the centuries, the tides brought millions of tons of lake bottom to shore. 
The winds tossed the beach inward, up the hillsides, and replaced the eroded landscape with the bronze blanket of soft sand you see today. The small town of Copper Harbor offers tourists, outdoor sports enthusiasts, historians, and just about anyone else something of interest. Located at the very tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula, this rugged town thrives during the summer months. Of all the villages, towns, and cities we talked about during the introduction, Copper Harbor is one of the strongest. It has ridden through the harshest winters at the northernmost tip of the peninsula. It has been fishing center, mining, and lumbering port. It has sustained a U.S. military frontier fort. Today, it flourishes to the sound of tourists who come for its history, its natural beauty, and its simplicity. Or you could join the hundreds of thousands who follow the winding trail to the top of the Keweenaw's most famous mountain, Brockway. A large sign proclaims the mountain statistics, and another gives a map of the area. At 735 feet above the lake below, and some 1,300 plus feet above sea level, Brockway Mountain cannot claim to be the highest peak in the country. It's not even the highest in the state. But it definitely ranks as one of the most memorable anywhere. Well, Robert, we appreciate the fact that you're meeting us here today and, and telling us a little bit about the fort. And it, it seems like we've got to some barracks or something here, and then we've got a gate, and we've got the fort behind us. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, welcome to Old Fort Wilkins. It's an 1844 era fort uh, okay. established with the mining boom, really the first great mining, big mining boom in this country. We have a little bit of everything. As you mentioned, we've got married enlisted men's cabins on the way into the stockade. Okay. Into the fort, we actually have 11 remaining original buildings uh, dated back to 1844. Um, everything you see around the horseshoe, the officer's quarters, the barracks, the mess halls, are all original buildings, uh, along with the quartermaster and sutler scores up, up on the hill. Uh, we do have a few reproductions that are done through archaeology and built at different periods from the 18, or excuse me, 1930s uh, through now. Well, why don't, uh, why don't you take us in? Absolutely. Let's, everybody will look at it. Huh? Let's get in the fort and we'll take yeah. a look around. Excellent. One of the first big mining booms in this uh, country that established that, the Copper Rush, basically, which opened the doors with the signing of the Treaty of La Pointe in 1842, created a great rush. Secretary of War and the U.S. government thought there might be an issue with Native Americans and copper miners and miners that uh, may lead to skirmishes. Now, the fort was built in 1844 in Garriston, um, but nothing ever came of that. It was pretty peaceful, and they ended up being more in policing amongst themselves. Oh, no kidding. Well, it must have been rough on the soldiers to be way up here. Uh, it is. The wilderness outpost really was a challenge. Long winters, a lot of time spent uh, doing woods, basically isolated. Copper Harbor is a deep water port. One of the reasons it was, you know, it was a mining boom and established with a fort. Um, ships could get in um, uh, through the port. But yeah, long winters, a lot of time working on just surviving. Um, minimal shipping on the lake at that time. I think there was two boats servi servicing the area. And so soldiers' way of life was a lot harder now. I mean, the day-to-day -day things, switching on a light switch or uh, getting heat, you know, didn't exist. Um, yeah, up and, here and you get eaten up with the bugs in the, in the summer you do. sometimes. And uh, I mean, it must have been rough for them, though. Really. It was. And the remoteness of the area and, and the same reasons that made life challenging is also the reason, you know, that's unique that we still have 11 remaining original buildings. Oh. Um, the fort was only open for three years. Um, it was abandoned at that point in time, and then it was um, reopened later. But during that big span between the close of the Civil War and 1847, when it closed, you know, the fort wasn't scavenged for lumber. It was kind of left because of that remoteness. Fort Wilkins was designed and built as a frontier fort, much like the forts of the Wild West. Its purpose was to demonstrate an official presence in order to keep the peace throughout the Keweenaw during the early days of the copper boom. The peace took different forms. First, between the incoming miners and the native tribes who had recently lost the area in the Treaty of La Pointe. Second, between the miners themselves, as land ownership and prospecting claims sometimes erupted into civil unrest. The fort took its first garrison in 1844. 
Unfortunately, the United States government sorely underestimated the fury of the north winds which would blow through this fort during the Keweenaw's many months of winter. Frostbite, death, and desertion came in the first winter. The second saw more of the same. The fort was closed in 1846. The geological history of the Upper Peninsula brought the fort another glimmer of life in the 1860s when troops were garrisoned here and once again charged with keeping the peace during the turbulent iron miner strike in Calumet at the peninsula's southern edge. Plant here in the Keweenaw Peninsula. We're out right now in the middle of nowhere, just about. We're with Charlie, and Charlie is going to be taking us out on a little bit of a hike. Yeah, we're going back to a, one of a very unusual river. The Montreal River is is a short river in the Keweenaw, only about 20 miles long, but it it courses across the backbone of the Keweenaw, all of the big lava flows that formed it, and then in the last mile, it it struggles to get through these lava flows to get to Lake Superior. So therefore, every time it goes, breaks through one of these basalt flows, it, it uh, creates a, has created a beautiful waterfall. So we're gonna go see some beautiful waterfalls. We had a really nice rain last night, so the river's gonna be full and it'll be beautiful. We got a fabulous day. We do have a fabulous day and I know everybody's anxious to get going, so let's go ahead and start it. You bet. Looking at the map, it became apparent that we'd have a cool mountain forest on one side and the naturally cool nature of Lake Superior on the other. How could it miss? Right through here is a pretty pristine place. I always tell the kids through here to watch out because there might be a dinosaur looking around the Because it's like an old prehistoric forest. It does. You know. These are very old cedars. They're probably 400 years old. and. Uh, they shade the ground so good that the one has to fall over before anything else can come up under it. As you look down here into the rocks, this is some of the lava flow that he was talking about. It, it uh, would come out and it formed down further, and you would get these areas in between the lava that was uh, a softer rock. And the waves have come in now and it's kind of cutting away at it. And that's why you get these points sticking out along the shoreline. Really pretty. It was no easy task getting to either one of these waterfalls, as the footpath along Lake Superior is rough going at best. Blowdowns and foot grabbing routes lie in wait for those who become impatient. But after hiking what was probably a mile along the often precipitous trail along Lake Superior, we finally came upon the first of the two Montreal River Falls. We were not disappointed. The Lower Falls is also the mouth of the Montreal River, and it plunges down a series of black rocky steps right into Lake Superior. From atop the falls, it looked to be at least a 20-foot total drop to the lake's surface. A series of rough benches in the rock breaks up the falls in a number of places to create the wonderfully soothing sounds a waterfall is famous for. As is usually the case, our favorite waterfall is the one we just happened to be visiting at the time. They have a way of doing that to you. But the powerful rush of the Montreal's whitewater meeting with the unyielding force of Lake Superior bordered on the sublime. It's been a while since we were affected in such a way. We 
moved up the trail from Lake Superior. The first falls came in right at Lake Superior there. We moved up now. You can see the river has calmed down. Uh, we're getting into a really wild area through here. You notice the river too is stained kind of a brown color from the tannic acid that's in the area. A lot of these uh, cedars give off that kind of stuff and, and color the water this way. Up ahead we can hear water again. It sounds like a roar. Could be just some rapids, might be the other falls that's up here. So we're going to head up and take a look. So the trail coming up the river is uh, a little rougher. It's a trail less traveled, let me tell you. Uh, we're still following the river. We're looking for the second falls. Uh, we've got separated from everyone, so we're kind of out here alone. It's kind of nice. It's peaceful. But in the same respect, it's a little spooky. <laughs> but that's okay. We're enjoying ourselves, and uh, we're going to keep going and see where it leads. About a half mile upstream from the lake and the lower falls is the upper falls. An invigorating and scenic footpath leads through a tangle of spruce and cedar trees along the river before revealing the first glimpse of the falls. Framed by more black rock, the falls are formed by water pouring 10 or 12 feet from a natural spout to a dark pool of water below. As if to rest, the river gathers itself for a moment in the pool before continuing downstream to the Lower Falls and Lake Superior. M26 runs up the western edge of the Keweenaw Peninsula between Eagle River and Copper Harbor. The road offers numerous scenic delights including lookout after lookout of Lake Superior and its rough-hewn rocky shore. It doesn't take long to figure why the Keweenaw has sprouted so many lighthouses during its years. Eagle Harbor has been a welcome refuge for hundreds of years. Its majestic lighthouse is heralded as one of the most picturesque and consequently most photographed lighthouse in the country. We're pretty proud of some of the video we've brought to you of this lighthouse over the years, and we have to tell you one of the very best is yet to come right in this program. Part of the fun of traveling around a place like the Keweenaw Peninsula is stopping in the small towns and getting a bite to eat. We're here right now in Eagle Harbor and we're at the Eagle Harbor Inn. And we're gonna go in, have a little dinner tonight. Then we're gonna go back over, check out the lighthouse and maybe we'll find a nice sunset somewhere too. But I'm sitting here with Mary, she's one of the owners here. And Mary, you've had the restaurant now for quite a while? Uh, 26 years. Okay, so you've been up here for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a really huge town. How many people live here? Um, about 40 in the wintertime and 250 in the summer. Oh, it really grows. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, and you, as you drive along here, this is a beautiful area to come into, too. Yeah. And, uh, we stopped in tonight to, to have a little meal. What kind of uh, food do you have? Um, we're known for the ribs, and we have the trout and uh, whitefish, and then all our desserts, soups, salsa, pesto, it's all made from scratch. We do a lot of homemade stuff, uh, good burgers. Okay. Tarpaulin. Uh, now, what about uh, uh, breakfast, lunch, is it all Just dinner? lunch and dinner. Lunch and dinner, okay. And you can also get a drink when you come in, too. Mm -hmm. One of the only places in town, I believe. Yep, and we have about 35 beers and 35 different wines. Okay, so it sounds like a person come in here and have a good meal. As the sun started its descent, we considered staying and filming the site from the summit. Instead, we had a couple of other thoughts and decided to try to capture some other shots. As you can see, the sun waited long enough for the guys to find the perfect position to capture the Eagle Harbor Lighthouse. In the movies, this is called magic time. In the Keweenaw, it's just another day.
Well, I hope you enjoyed today's show. We're going to end it right where we started, right on the Great Sand Bay here on the Keweenaw Peninsula. If you'd like more information, you can go to our website at greatgetaways.tv. Everything you need will be there to make the same kind of trip we did. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another Great Getaway. Production of Great Getaways is made possible by Rocky's Great Outdoors. Located in Burton, Michigan, Rockies carries a complete line of motorcycle, snowmobile, camping, and hiking gear, including canoes and kayaks. State Building Company, serving mid-Michigan for over 50 years, with quality windows, insulation, roofing, and siding, including complete residential and commercial remodeling. Forward Corporation, operating over 30 complete convenience centers, motels, and restaurants across Northeast Michigan.